everybody! Well, well, welcome! Welcome to the Anti-Monopoly Happy Hour. I am your host, Ron Knox, Senior Researcher with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, your friendly neighborhood Monopoly crusher. It is Wednesday, June 2nd, 2021. Welcome to the premiere, the very number one episode of the Happy Hour. We are extraordinarily happy to be here and extraordinarily happy to have you with us um it should be a lot of fun let me introduce today's co-host your friend and mine tom grassler tommy what's happening buddy hey ron how's it going uh, uh thanks for having me uh i don't have very many anti-monopoly bona fides so i'm really just a guy uh but uh happy to chat whinge analyze uh and uh and yeah just generally uh generally hold up a magnifying glass to this society of ours Great. And hopefully come out with some uh with some solutions. We're gonna come out with some solutions out of this episode. Yeah, oh are we? Uh <laughs> yeah, we're gonna come out with a with a you know, basically like a full a full uh array of of market based solutions to show how you personally can uh can fix all this with your actions. <laughs> oh why? All right. I don't think we're gonna need any of that. We can't solve the problem because then the um we wouldn't need the happy hour anymore. So let's not do that. Uh <laughs> we're gonna do we're going to do news. We're going to do DC, Washington, DC versus Amazon. We're going to do Apple versus Epic, the clash of the Titans in court. And we're going to talk to our very special guest, author, bookseller, gentleman, Danny Kane. We're excited for all that. Let's do the beer. Beer of the week. 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 Okay. What do we got? I am drinking. Just about to crack open a Odell Brewing Company Mountain Standard IPA. I think it's like a seasonal. I don't think this is like out all the time. This is like a seasonal they have. And I like it because it's freaking tasty. That's one thing. And then I like Odell's. Odell's is independent. I can show you. I can show you. Get it on the camera. There it is. See the little upside down bottle? Mm-hmm. That is their that is the independent craft brewers association uh seal of approval as it were and it is your uh indication that the beer you are drinking is owned by like a nice grandma somewhere no not really but owned by like a small company or a family or whatever not by a big nasty corporate conglomerate like Budweiser AB InBev is their known Miller the other one and so on. So I like that, like that. And also Odell's is great because Odell's is employee owned. Love, you love to see it. That's what I'm all about. I'm all about democratizing the economy. What's up? So cheers to that. Tommy, you got a beer tonight? Yes, sir. I've got a uh, Workhorse West Coast IPA from uh, Workhorse Brewing here. Uh, King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. After the great, uh, Fe- after Frederick the Great, it's a uh, grandfather King of, of uh, it's called King, oh, King of, of Prussia. Prussia. That's what it's called. Home of, uh, yeah, the, the place is called King of Prussia. Oh. It's a uh, home of a gigantic luxury mall. Uh, anyone in Philadelphia area would be like, ooh, that's the, uh, that's the fancy mall that, uh, with the good Chipotle. Um, <laughs> but yeah, n- <laughs> named after, uh, Frederick the Great, grandfather of, uh, of Kaiser Wilhelm, everybody's favorite Prussian. Um, wow. wow. You okay? All right, that's great. How's the beer? Is it good? Is it tasty? Oh yeah, it's a, it's it's nice and dank. Seven ABV, resinous citrus. Resinous uh, workhorse citrus. is pretty solid. Also, a big fan that they are distributed at my local Acme uh, UFCW, of which uh, my father is a proud proud union member. Yeah. Uh, Acme sells beers now, and these guys are nice and local, sold in your local grocery store. So, uh, cheers, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov. Cheers. All right, let's do. It's time for the news. Washington D.C. Hello, hi, <laughs> and we're back. You know it. It says like news information. Like, <laughs> all right. Yeah, I can't see that. You can't see that. You have to watch the show. You have to watch the show. You like it. Um, Washington. Uh, I got a conflict at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you double booked. Um. The attorney general in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, and by the name of Carl Racine, has sued 
Amazon, world's worst and most notorious monopolist, for uh, raising prices for consumers who shop online basically anywhere. Let me tell you about the nefarious scheme that uh, that is alleged in this lawsuit. And it's not really, I mean, honestly, it's not like much of a secret. This kind of stuff has been like reported on and whatever for a long time. But the basics. So Amazon, back in the day, which is like five years ago, uh, Amazon used to put what are called most favor nations agreements in its contracts with third party sellers. These are like small businesses and other folks who rely on Amazon's monopoly marketplace in order to reach consumers. For folks who don't know about what Amazon, like what makes Amazon a monopoly, well, like uh, one out of every $2 spent online is spent on Amazon. Amazon controls a massive portion of all online retail, like 70 plus percent, especially for some like product categories like home goods and books and so on. Um, and so Amazon has this monopoly, which means that's where all the customers are. So if you're like another business, if you're like selling, um, you know, whatever clothes, um, uh, rolling pins, I'm just making stuff up and you want to reach your customers online, chances are you got to be on Amazon. I mean, really you have to be on Amazon. You're just not going to get the customer base. So that's the monopoly power. And what the lawsuit says is that. The contracts that Amazon would um, would would offer these like third party sellers, these small businesses, essentially said, "You are prohibited if you if you want to sell here and you want access to our um, hundreds of millions of shoppers. You cannot sell the things that you sell for less than what you sell on Amazon anywhere else on the internet." So. Like if you sell if you sell um, a, a a rolling pin for thirty bucks uh, on on Amazon, then it's got to that same rolling pin has to be thirty dollars on you on your own website, the business's own website, on eBay, on like Walmart, like wherever. All right, so that's the rule. And 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 those are like explicit agreements. So, uh, so antitrust enforcers in Europe along with uh, U.S. lawmakers and others, looked at this and said, you can't do that. That's illegal. It's like flat out illegal. You can't have these, you can't have these clauses. And Amazon said, okay, well, maybe we, should, uh, maybe we shouldn't have these clauses and drops the clauses. But it replaced those clauses with a thing called a price parity policy. It's not a, it's not a rule, but... Amazon catches you selling your stuff for less than what you sell it on Amazon, you're going to get, you're either going to get buried in Amazon's algorithm, or you might get removed from the, from, from the, from the marketplace altogether. Not, hey, a, hey, rule, Ron. not a rule, not a rule, but don't, but, but you don't want, but you don't want this to happen to you. So like, what would a, what would like a nice parallel to this be? Imagine I, uh, Imagine I run a pizza shop. Yeah. Would this be an equivalent of like, if you come in, the pie is 10 bucks, but if you want to, if you want it delivered, uh, the pie is 14, but then now the delivery service is saying you can't sell your pie for your own price at your own place or literally anywhere else. Yeah. Kind of. It's kind of like that. Are there any other outputs? Are there any parallels in the rest of society that says like, if you do business with one entity, you can't, do business with any other entity in any other manner. Yeah. I mean, those are absolutely, I mean, those, you know, exclusive dealing or exclusivity clauses and contracts, those are relatively common. They should run afoul of our laws intended to um, ensure open markets and ensure free competition. Decades of really terrible policy at the federal level and beyond, they aren't really enforced in that way, but yes, but do it exactly. It would be it would be the equivalent if you if you own a pizza shop and you got to get your pepperoni from a guy and that guy's a pepperoni. He's like he's he's the pepperoni guy. But you're a big you're like Pizza Hut or whatever. You're like you own all the pizza shops in town, except for maybe a few. 
you get that pepperoni from the pepperoni guy at a price. And you tell that pepperoni guy, you say, look, if you want to keep selling to me, I own all the, sh- I own most of the shops in town. If you want to keep selling to me, you're going to give me the best price. You cannot give a lower price to any of these other shops out here. And if I hear that you did, I'm going to find another pepperoni guy. That's kind of, that's kind of what it's like. Does that make sense? And that's how this power is being exercised, right? Because normally you can just tell somebody to go pound sand. You're like, well, I'll go find another contract. I yeah. don't care. But if you own everything, then it's that, that's the, like that, that, and that's a monopoly. That's a monopoly. So a third party seller, small business that has to use Amazon to get to customers, it wouldn't dare risk getting buried in the algorithm. So customers never lay eyes on the product and can just buy, I'm going to go back to the rolling pin thing. Okay. Let's say there are five companies that sell rolling pins or probably more than that on Amazon. You don't want to be, you know, number five or number 10 or whatever it is way down the list. You know what I mean? You like you need to be up at the top and you're going to do everything in your power to stay up at the top. And so you and so you're not going to break this price parity policy. And so and so you know, look, like the point is is that this stuff has been known forever. Like we've known that Amazon does this. Um it's no secret that it bullies small businesses that rely on it in this way. So the question is, why now? And 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 Look, I, I, I want to stress this is important because this is the first ever major government level antitrust action against Amazon in, in the U.S. Yeah, what's the significance of our old pal Carl Racine here? Like, why? Like, is, is there significance in the fact that it's D.C. and not a state and not a no. city AG? No, because it acts like a state. It acts like a state attorney general because D.C., you know, D.C. is organized like a state. They just don't have... Um, they're, they don't have like official statehood, but they're organized like a state and the government is. So no. The, but could like the Makanji, Pennsylvania AG levy this? Hmm. No, nope. here's why. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, lots. Sure. I mean, the federal government could bring, could bring this case, uh, an attorney general in any other state that has antitrust laws on the books, right. Can bring this kind of case. And it's important because. Um, because what, what Racine alleges is a particular kind of harm and that's a harm to consumers. And in the current, under current, you know, antitrust doctrine, even though it's wrongheaded, even though it's like, it's been a, it's failed immeasurably across the board, you still have to, at the moment, have to prove have to show and prove consumer harm as, as, as in higher prices or lower output, probably higher prices, in order to successfully bring an antitrust case. So what this lawsuit says, and the, reason, and the thing that makes it novel, is because what's actually happening is there's a lot of harm to small business. But he doesn't focus on that. He focuses on these higher prices that end up being pervasive around, around the internet because of Amazon's market power and because of the way that it dominates the small businesses that sell on its site. So whereas consumers could go in a, in a perfect like competitive market where, where this didn't happen, consumers could go find a lower price on eBay or on their, or they could, or, you know, the business could offer a lower price on its own website or whatever. It could do this, but for Amazon's power and Amazon's forcing them to keep the prices up all the way, all over, not just on Amazon, but all over. Now, no, 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 this is the, this is, this is the, this is the most important nugget of this whole thing. And this is made explicit in the lawsuit. And also, um, my organization, ILSR, so the beginning, uh, we made this, this, uh, really, really clear in a report that we did, um, earlier this year called Amazon's Monopoly Toll Booth. I will drop a link in, uh, in the chat here in a second, but, but, um, what, is clear from the lawsuit is that the reason these prices is because um, because Amazon nickels and dimes every small business every independent seller that sells on its website that on its on its marketplace because it can again this is a this is it this is a this is a uh, uh, a use and abuse of Amazon's monopoly power so Amazon can say. You need to be on our on our marketplace because we got all the customers. Okay, you want to be on our marketplace? Here's what you got to pay. 
you got to pay our regular cut off the top just for like the privilege of being on this marketplace where, oh, by the way, Amazon is going to compete with you head to head if it feels like it. Amazon is going to like arbitrarily like bury your listing if it feels like it, or it's going to take your whole store down if it feels like it. You got to pay for that privilege. And then if you want the, if you want to be prime and you want prime subscribers to be able to, to, to um, one click buy your thing, you definitely got to use Amazon's fulfillment. You got to use their, you know, their storage, their shipping, all that stuff. Got to use that. And that costs a price. And then maybe if you want the customer, if you want, you know, shoppers to see you, you probably, you're probably going to have to buy a little advertising friend. Oh, from who? From, oh, geez. From who? From Amazon, from the mothership. So then you add all, so then, so then you add all this up. And in order for these small businesses to even make like a mar, like the world, the world's thinnest margin of a profit on any of this stuff, they got to put their prices up. So Amazon artificially inflates these prices. And that's one thing. And what Racine is saying is not only do you do that, these prices are artificially high all because of your dominance. Then you reinforce those artificially high prices all across the freaking internet. Because this is the real, so I've got, I take slight issue with the consumer welfare standard. I feel, I feel like, you know, this is some real armchair quarterbacking here, but I feel like the only, the only, the only like welfare is really the, is, is, is really the operative term here. Like, I feel like the, in this case, they're, they're judging it by prices. Like your welfare is directly like, is it more expensive or is it not? And that's kind of the only measure, I guess, that's provable in court. But I feel like that little political football of like the consumer welfare is like, well, is it slightly more expensive or is it slightly less expensive? Or like, I feel like that incentivizes it to like track just a hair above inflation so that you don't see the price creep. Like if it jumps too much, like they'll clearly get got because they just have to kind of stay within the bounds of that consumer welfare standard where I would argue on the other side of it, consumer welfare is also like not having really shitty products because like, as those, <laughs> as those yeah. margins get thinner and thinner, like not just your price is getting higher and like at a creep that your average frog boiling in a pot, isn't really going to notice. But at the same time, like, yes, it's drifting up that like your $13 plastic piece of shit thing you bought on Amazon is now the 13 75. And then in two years it's 16. It's also the quality of it is getting lower and lower because they need to squeeze like there's continual pressure on the production quality of, of the goods that end up on there as well. And I feel like that's much, much harder to kind of crystallize and like make an argument in a court of law. So I feel like consumer welfare just gets to be like, okay, is it slightly more expensive or is it not? And I feel like it's a myopic way to measure that kind of thing because consumers are being harmed in a million ways that aren't just like my price when I click on the Amazon thing. Mm. It's like the ripple effect that it has through the entire marketplace about like the collapse of our neighborhoods and like the oh, death yeah. of brick and mortar retail. Like all of those things to me are also consumer welfare. And I feel like it's really hard to get up there and, and, and make that point. And it's almost like when we measure consumer welfare in purely price and price creep, we're still playing Amazon's little game. Oh, of course we are. Do it, of course. Look, there are some there's some antitrust folks, like scholarly type folks and economists, who um, who uh, who advocate for this thing called like the total welfare like standard or the or the 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 real consumer welfare standard, and that kind of gets to what you're talking about, right? Because it's not just price. It's not just like as <laughs> if we are just going to be like shepherded into the lane of consumers and that's what we're going to be under like late capitalism. Okay. That, that's fine. But so then what are all the things that make uh, the, the process of consuming goods uh, one that one that could um, that could bestow some welfare upon us, right? Yes. It's low prices, but it's also like innovative goods. It's also like, it's also access to like necessary things when we need them, which means like there has to be resiliency in the system. There has to be like, you know, there can't be, you saw like JBS beef gets, you know, gets hacked for one day and their, and their um, meat processing plants get shut down for one day. And like people like, like literally lose their jobs in their homes and like, you know, grocery store shelves empty. 
just in time economy, baby. Is, is that is that wealth? But is that what anyone's welfare? Right. I mean, so that's the question. My point on that note is that like <clears throat> we, <laughs> like anyone, any rational person, will you know will be able to 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 understand that like we are not just consumers. That is not the thing that we do. We are not cons- we yes we do consume, but we are also like workers. We are people with, that have jobs. We are members of our communities, right? We are voters. We are like all of these other things, right? The the like being a part of society is a much broader spectrum of 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 duties than going to shop for your stuff that you need. So that's my thing. So the consumer welfare standard, even the even like the real consumer welfare standard, I think misses the mark because it because it doesn't get to all these other roles that people that people you know, play and the other side to the market too. It's not just like, yes, people go buy things from Walmart, but where does Walmart get their stuff? They get their stuff from suppliers that they can squeeze. You know what I mean? And they, and you know, and so on. There are these, all these ripple effects and they have like, and you know, and they have worker labor is just an input for Walmart. So they can just pay workers whatever they want because sometimes they're the only employer in town, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, a little bit off track there, but yes, but yes. So the lawsuit, Racine's lawsuit, um, you know, this DC lawsuit, it, it, it talks about the, you know, the harm to small business in, in Amazon's arbitrary monopoly tolls that it charges everybody just to use its infrastructure. But it frames it in a way that, uh, is, I'll say more likely to have success in court. And I think that's really, really super important. Who knows where it'll go? It's early days. The lawsuit just got filed. So we'll see. Um, but it's, uh, but it's exciting, uh, uh, and interesting stuff for sure. And I'm assuming that, you know, I think this is just like, this is the first crack at this nut, so to speak. And there's, there's a lot more coming Amazon's way. I could, I can only assume. Does this have, uh, any ripple effects on, uh, the crystal city development? No. Is Carl Racine putting no. this whole thing on the line? <laughs> no. I don't think so. I don't think so. But, but you know, what's, but look, I'll say this in the lawsuit is really important in the lawsuit is a request for structural remedies. What do structural remedies mean? That means that you, in order to fix this problem, you must change the structure of the company. That's what it's asking the court to do. If the court, if the, if the judge sees fit, right? That is is huge because you would look at this problem and you would say okay one of the remedies is just to just to kill these price parity clauses let's just squash those and then the problem goes away and then we have and then everything's good that's one approach but that's not the approach that was taken here the approach that was taken here and i'm reading into this this is not word for word in the lawsuit so please this is just me reading into it but the approach taken here is to say okay maybe amazon the marketplace being you know connected to amazon the fulfillment company the you know storage and shipping company that raises these prices in the first place that inflates these prices way beyond the competitive level maybe that's the problem and if amazon was not both the marketplace and the shipping company maybe we wouldn't have these high prices in the first place and this and this wouldn't there wouldn't be this consumer harm because because this wouldn't happen so I don't know. That's again, that that is not explicitly in the lawsuit. I'm just extrapolating a little bit, but it will be interesting to see. Let's move on. We have another news item. Oh, there it is. I tuned into this. I tuned into the Twitch on my dual monitor experience and saw our little news icon there. Oh, yeah. What that's do you think? Cool. Did, did, yeah, did you like it? Yeah, it was, it was, it was great. I loved it. It's really high tech. I use the most high tech graphics I could find. <laughs> this week, a mega, an epic. I'm going to use the word epic because I have to. Uh, an epic mega antitrust trial between two titans of industry, between Apple and Epic Games. Epic Games, uh, I'm assuming everyone listening to this probably knows Epic Games. Epic Games makes Fortnite. The maybe second or third most popular video game of all time. Um, they went to trial. Why did they go to trial? The trial wrapped up this week. That's the that's the big news. It ended this week, but but Epic sued Apple in court, alleging that Apple 
is abusing its monopoly power by forcing all apps <clears throat> like Fortnite or any other Epic app to go through Apple's own, you know, app store. And while it's there, using Apple's payment system and paying Apple its uh, arbitrary 30% fee just for the just for the right to sell your stuff on Apple. On to... Hey Ron, I'm detecting a I'm detecting a pattern here. Mm. There's a it seems like there's something uh th- th- there's something pretty similar between what Apple is doing and what Amazon is doing. It, there indeed there is. There's, there's... What is that what is that called, Ron? <laughs> I don't know. The um it's this is a problem. So what what this lawsuit exposed is is the power and the abuse of power um, of Apple's platform. And, the, and this is a problem that extends to all platforms, all monopoly platforms, right? Because it's the platform, which is the, just the word that we've come up with to talk about things like Apple and Amazon and Google and Facebook and so on, Spotify. All it means is infrastructure. And these companies own this crucial infrastructure upon which, you know, commerce and information flows and must flow because, because of its monopoly, because of its power. And so these companies can just nickel and dime, can charge whatever they want to uh, for the, you know, the privilege of using this monopoly platform in order to reach either their customers when it comes to shopping or eyeballs when it comes to advertising or listeners when it comes to music, all these kinds of things, right? So this is different. I'm not going to get into the whole backstory, but there's there's an antitrust, uh, uh, a competition law, as they say, case in Europe against Apple, or investigation, I should say, investigation of Apple in Europe that started with a complaint from Spotify. Again, these are big, big companies. These are like titans of industry, like, you know, clashing. I don't have a lot of sympathy for any of these companies involved, by the way. Let them fight. Let them fight. But, um, you know, but Spotify, you know, was saying that, um, that as with every other app maker, who wants to reach um, iPhone customers that they're having to go through Apple's app store and they're having to use Apple's payment system. And they're having to pay this like 30 like arbitrary 30% cut off the top. And they're having to do this. And Spotify's thing was really interesting. Spotify's complaint is because it's because Spotify and Apple are direct competitors, right? Because Apple owns Apple music, obviously, And these two companies go head to head for music subscribers, um, you know, for for um, uh, for uh, streaming subscriptions, streaming music subscriptions. They're they're number one and number two. Spotify is number one with a bullet as far as paid streaming music services. You know what, though? Spotify's phones are terrible. (laughs) You you wouldn't want a Spotify phone. That's really the thing. But. So that's different. So that's a rival. That's a rival bringing this complaint. And so the rivalry and the fact that this is allegedly um, Apple harming a direct competitor in an anti-competitive way, that is one that's, you know, it's important. And that's the kind of, you know, the kind of complaint that to my ear is the kind of thing that's going to hold water and and you know probably gain a little traction and you can see it's already gained traction since um europe opened a big investigation of apple epic case is different because epic is saying you know they don't really go head to head they're not really going head to head um with apple um they're just saying this is wrong you're just they're like we don't you're we just don't feel like doing this us. Yeah, you're just nickel and diming us for no reason, and you won't allow some alternative way to get to iPhone users other than to go through your app store 
use your payment system, accept the fee, that's it. So I think that's really, really, really super important. Um, uh, so in a, in a way, do they have less of a, as almost like the receiver of platform services, do they have less of a leg to stand on without some kind of overarching monopoly ruling? Because otherwise they're like, yeah, cool, we'll go, don't use our business, see you later. I don't know. I don't know if they have, like, you know, I wouldn't put it that way, but I, it, but it's different than being directly in competition with each other. Like Spotify is saying, look, we got to pay this fee. We got to, you know, this is eating into our, my, our revenue because we got to pay Apple. Meanwhile, Apple's like Apple music comes on the phone. You can't get it off the dang phone. <laughs> it's like free with the thing, right? So that's different. Now that is the, you know, that's real, you know, that the, there are different terms for that in the law, but you would say that is an, an, an instance of raising rivals costs, unfairly raising rivals costs because you um, own infrastructure that they have to use in order to just like clear customers. gilded age, anti-monopoly old school stuff. Abs yeah, I mean, absolutely. Just, just uh, uh, you know, pretty clear stuff under the law. The Epic lawsuit and trial has been really interesting, but just different. Because again, Epic is just saying, look, you have a, you have a monopoly in this market. And the market is the question. What are we, what in, what's the industry we're talking about? Well, the market we're talking about are like iPhone users, not all game people. Everybody that plays Fortnite, right? We're talking about iPhone users. So and like, I, it, do you have a leg to stand on when you're like, okay, you have a monopoly on this thing? Can I just keep narrowly defining monopolies? Like, not to defend Apple here in any way, but like, couldn't I, as a competitor, just narrowly defend like? Oh, the, you guys have a monopoly on people that are eating at this Taco Bell right now, mm. <laughs> and you're not letting me sell tacos. And like, but what else am I going to do if I want to sell tacos to the guys in this Taco Bell? Look, I mean, they could be like, but that, but that question cuts both ways. I understand what you're saying, but that question cuts both ways because, like, you know, pro monopoly people, right? Like corporations and they're and they're lawyer, they're like hired lawyers and they're hired economists have been trying to like, um you know, game the market definition system forever. And it works and it works both ways. So like plaintiffs will also allege the market that best fits the argument they're trying to make that there's all been, gamers. That there's been there's been monopoly harm. So, so this is, is this is kind of the so in the end this is like to bring it back to like it's the same problem is that we incentivize people we incentivize entities to just become monopoly platforms. That's actually the peak thing you could possibly be in capitalism in the year of our Lord 2021 is like a platform owner where you just get so big, you have to force people to play ball. Um, a really interesting thing from this through the Epic trial part, like this, like part of this verge story that goes through the whole thing is that like Xbox sells Xboxes at a loss. Like they don't make any money on Xboxes. Like they make all their money like on the Xbox store. iPhones are sold at a complete loss. Like we're all paying insane numbers for iPhones, but like they don't they don't care. They don't care at all because what they want is the platform and for everybody else, like they're just getting it from every single side. Like if you own the platform and the payment system, if you own the advertising system and also where all of your web data is stored and also the how we ship it and how we sell it. like right. once you own all of those things just everybody has to pay you and you're incentivized to operate at a complete loss for as infinity as it takes until you're a big enough platform like uber hasn't made a dime right it hasn't made a dime all it is is a platform they don't own cars they don't pay healthcare they don't like develop roads just they just do absolutely nothing except exist it's a private equity monopoly play they're just trying to they're they're, they're just they're just you know like eating the losses, they're just taking the losses in exchange for market share until they get to the point where they can they can hike up the prices because there's no because there's there's no one else out there doing it. They, yeah, how I mean, do they right. keep getting away with it? Like, isn't the problem like isn't the problem event like I guess 
you know, you can spend your money on whatever you want, but isn't the problem on private equity the, dummies no, that just pro- keep look the problem why can they keep getting away with it? We we've, we've we've already we already mentioned the issue, right? It's that for the last forty years in the world of monopoly regulation and anti monopoly regulation, all that mattered was price, right? And so because Uber's back and we're, and we're getting a little bit off the trial. I do want to get back to it because there's some really interesting stuff that came out in the trial. But real sorry, quickly, this is mainly what I do is get you off track. <clears throat> You're getting me off track. With... That's fine. That's fine. I like it. You know, but Uber's thing, and, this is, and it's not just Uber, by the way. Like Amazon didn't have a, a profitable year until like three, four years ago. If you have the private equity backing, you have the Wall Street backing, you have all this money, and you can take these losses... And you can convert those losses into low prices for people under modern antitrust doctrine, which is not traditional by any means. This is like an extremist view of what this sh- of what this should be. This is like the libertarian view of how of how this regulation should work. Right? If you can offer lower prices, you're good. And all the other stuff, all the other waves and waves of harm that are happening in your industry and in the overall economy don't matter because this price is low. So every every cab driver making a middle class wage with a medallion that gets put out of business by Uber, that doesn't matter. That's just one guy they don't have to fight later. That's just one guy. Yeah, it doesn't matter because um, some schmo who's, you know, Who's uh, who's trying not to drunk drive home from the bar uh, is paying half of what of what they would pay in a taxi. You know what I mean? So like, so anyway, so that's so like you wonder how this can happen. That that's exactly how this can happen. It's just it's just been bad policy. So, um, so yeah. So that was really interesting about the Xbox, and it's really interesting to look at loss leaders across all these tech companies because they're just they're trying to get you in, they're trying to get you onto the platform, they're trying to build the, they're trying to grow the platform, as you said, so that they can nickel and dime everyone who's then forced to use the platform to like reach an audience, whatever that audience looks like, whether they're buying something or they're or they're reading something or whatever whatever it might be. The other really interesting thing I wanted to point out um, that came. Uh, it was mentioned in the trial. It kind of came out earlier, but the trial really brought it to light. Is again, I'm, I'm getting, I'm going to come back to Amazon because Lord, Lord have mercy. This, this fucking company, is so wildly powerful that they can literally bully another massive, wealthy monopolist like Apple. At one point, the most valuable company on earth. And what came out in this trial is that Amazon, it, it, again, mentioned in the trial, had come out earlier, but, but I want to bring it up. At some point, uh, if you, you know, like you, you try to use Amazon video, you try to use it on the phone or the iPad or whatever, and you can't buy a movie on Amazon video, or you used to not be able to buy a movie or buy a, like a series of shows or whatever, like on the app. And that was intense. You still like, you still can't buy like an ebook on, on like audible. They even on its own, which it owns that's even on its own platform. A, yeah. That's a different, that's a different story, but yes, that's a different story. But, but Amazon forever was like, look, every transaction that happens within the Apple ecosystem has to go through Apple's payment system. Apple's going to take the 30% cut. We're not messing with that. And for every other, most every other company on earth, Apple says, okay, tough cookies. That's what you, that's what you want to do. Okay. But not Amazon, buddy. No, sir. You open up Prime Video app on your iPhone and you can rent movies, buy movies, buy a show, whatever you want to do. And guess what cut of that Apple gets? Nothing, bro. Not It's not I. 30%. Bro, nothing. Cuz Amazon just says, "Look, I, 
You need us. You need us more than we need you. So, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to sell stuff and you're not taking nada from it. That, that is one, that is true power. And it also demonstrates that there's a different set of rules. This is the problem with the platform in the first place, is that the rules of engagement on the platform are entirely arbitrary. They're freaking made up by the platform to suit its interests at any point in time. That's it. Okay. This is, the, this is why we talk about a private, we talk about these monopolies being private governments. Because in a regular government, an actual elected government of by and for the people, the laws are decided by people who we chose for their wisdom or their, or whatever, or things go to a referendum and voters just vote. That's one way to do it. When you have a private monopoly, that runs its own private government, these rules are arbitrary. So, so Apple says, yeah, if you want to, if you, uh, if you're like a, if you're Joe Schmo app maker and you want to sell an app on the, on our app store, cool, great. You're going to use our stuff and you're going to give us 30%. That's the end of the story. Unless you're Amazon. And then it's cool. It's, it's probably fine. You don't have to pay anything. Or if you're Netflix, yeah, maybe you got to pay a little bit, but you don't have to pay the whole thing. We'll do some cross advertising deals. We'll like, we'll, we'll figure out a way. There are rules for schmoes like you and me. And there's freedom for monopolists to do whatever they want to do under the current system. That's what came out in the trial for me. And it drives me insane. I hope Epic wins this one, but we'll see. It's a, it's a puzzle. The judge has got to make a decision. I don't know when it's going to happen. All right, that's it. Great. <laughs> that's, um, the, that's the news. <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's all bad. It's all bad. Um, yeah, I hope Epic, I hope Epic gets uh, gets uh, to put one on the chin of old Apple there. But uh, uh, frankly, like like I was kind of saying before that like their argument is just kind of like we don't feel like it. And like, while I agree with that sentiment, I feel like some, uh, some like neocon judge might not. So who knows? Who knows? All right. We're going to skip story time this week. We don't have time for story time because I want to get right to our guest of honor. Very special guest this week. He is the owner of the Raven bookstore right down the road from me in Lawrence, Kansas. He is also the author of a new book, used to be a pamphlet, used to be a flyer, or a zine, a zine, a zine. Um, now it's a book called How to Resist Amazon and Why. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Danny Kane. Hello, thank you for having me. So glad to be here on, uh, on Twitch and on, on Amazon owned Twitch. Amazon owned Twitch, exactly. <sighs> Using the master's tools. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to get to, um, I want to get to your book, How to Resist Amazon, and why. And I want to read a little passage from the intro because oh, there it is. You got it. You got it. I want to read a little, um, a little passage from the intro because I like it very much. So um, it starts. Doo -doo -doo -doo. It starts here. Uh, it doesn't start here. It goes in uh, the the introduction of this book is wonderful. It talks about the passion. Um, that Danny has for selling books um, and and the passion that his employees have at his independent bookstore uh, right there in downtown Lawrence, Kansas. And then, and then it comes here. Since 1995, we watched as Amazon has become a bigger and bigger threat to that work. That's the work of selling books. There has never been a company as big, powerful, and pervasive as Amazon is disruptive to the ability of small businesses to stay afloat Amazon is a continuation of the story begun when Walmart and other megastores began their rapid spread. Amazon is indeed the latest link in a chain of threats to the American retail small business from shopping malls to chain megastores to online e-commerce giants, each acting in their own pernicious way 
to destroy the American downtown. That's powerful. These are powerful words. But let me ask you this. Danny, you run a bookstore. Amazon's a bookstore. You guys are on the same team, right? What's the problem? What's, what's going on? Tell me about that. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a good question. Um, we, we run a bookstore because we love books. We sell books. We're very good at it. We serve a community that's interested in buying books. The story begins and ends with books. Uh, Amazon, as we've been discussing, does so much more. They're um, a, a monopoly of an e-commerce platform. They sell shit on the platform at the risk of the pe other people who are selling on the platform. They, they own Twitch. They have Whole Foods. They have Amazon Web Services, which holds up a uh, majority of the internet. They have such a giant portfolio uh, in so many different ways to make money that they can use their, their retail arm to kind of um, experiment and, and disrupt and try to force their their competitors out of business, even if it means they don't make a ton of money on retail. So they're not actually in this to sell books. They're, they're in this to, to gobble up people's data and to gobble up more and more power. Um, so we're not, in fact, playing the same sport at all. And like it used to be, and it should be, uh, and in some lucky places like Lawrence, Kansas, it still is. If you want to sell books to a literary community and do a good job of it, you can make a good living and, and pay a good wage to your employees. But that's getting harder and harder. Uh, as Amazon and companies like it get more and more powerful. Yeah. So look, uh, you got to explain to me and to and to the folks watching, like you know how you got here, right? You know, you start off as a bookseller. You buy a bookstore that you love and that you used to work at, um, and you go from that to now being essentially uh, a leading small business voice in this fight against monopoly power bro, that's a journey. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like that's a, and this is, and this happened in a few years. How did, this is like light speed. Tell me how, how your life kind of took this turn and how you got here. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have to give a lot of credit to the Ravens original owners, Pat Katie and Mary Lou Wright. They opened the store in 1987 in November of 1997, a borders books and music superstore opened right across the street. And like that was a uh, small business trial by fire. Number one. And they did an amazing job. Uh, leading the Raven through this this extremely difficult era of operating across the street from a business that had a much bigger inventory, uh, much lower prices, and a lot more corporate power in the book world than they did, which is a story that's, of course, familiar to us now. And they did it by uh, by speaking really clearly about the importance of small businesses and the risks of corporate consolidation and the threat a place like Borders has to a place like downtown Lawrence. And I just took their methods of of kind of clear-headed communication and, and passionate advocacy and applied it to our, our current era. Of course, as borders faded away um, and, and Barnes and & Noble chugs along, the bigger threat is, is Amazon now emerging from their ashes. Uh, and it, it's just a matter of, of educating and telling our story. They use newspaper op-eds and, and newspaper interviews and letter writing campaigns. I use Twitter and social media, but it's really the same story and the same fight. Uh, and then a couple of the tweets got some attention and a, a bookstore owner friend of mine encouraged me to turn some of this stuff into a zine. This is the original. There it is. There it is. I got, I got, a, I, got a, in black and white. I got a stack of copies of that nice. uh, in my house. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is just a, a collection of the, the advocacy and thoughts of, of Danny Kane and the Raven bookstore over a year or so. Um, I, I originally started self-publishing it um, even within the first week. Uh, demand from other bookstores and our customers was so high. I was spending every night at my dining room table stapling zines, which felt like cool and punk and DIY. I loved it. Uh, yeah. But like I have a wife, I have a kid, <laughs> uh, I have a business to run. Uh, so in steps, uh, Microcosm Publishing out of Portland, they put out their own version of the zine and helped me distribute it. They're really cool. They're one of the few publishers who have completely cut ties with Amazon. Very, very few public. It's because of the problem we've been talking about. The people feel like they can't. A publisher feels like they can't sever ties with Amazon at all. But Microcosm is like, we're going to. Uh, and it's worked out really well for them. They do their own distribution. Um, their, their version of the zine sold uh, five figures, more than 10,000 copies. And they were like, dude, this is a runaway hit. People are interested. People want to talk about this. Would you be interested in expanding it into a book? So we went back and forth about the concept a little bit. Um, 
And I went to see, um, to Washington, D.C., the American Booksellers Association hosted an antitrust um, kind of day field trip for booksellers. Mm -hmm. I saw Stacey Mitchell from ILSR um, speak. I was inspired by this antitrust stuff um, and, and the policy angle, which I didn't really get to in the zine. So I was like, all right, let's, let's turn this into a book. Um, I think this, I need to really kind of tackle these policy questions as well as the, the small business advocacy. And so that, I mean, this came out in March. Yeah. Um, yeah. From microcosm. Now you're, folks in Portland. And, and now you're front and center. You're part of our small business rising coalition um uh within, uh, within I, yeah and i cited uh, amazon's monopoly toll booth in the book i cited a ton of ilsr work right um i i talk about that 30 percent figure all the time because it's just truly staggering yeah um i can't imagine running a business handing over 30 percent to the 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 platform that i use that's ridiculous Dude. it would we would last a couple weeks so okay but but so this brings me to an important question you talk about this a little bit in the book and you and i have talked about this before but can you Explain to folks just a little bit, like give a couple examples of how um, the power of Amazon and the pervasiveness of Amazon affect your day to day work in the shop, in the Raven, trying to sell books and trying to and trying to make a living. Yeah, well, I mean, number one, um, I, the, the lawsuit, Racine's lawsuit in, in terms of raising prices is really interesting. Um, but like one way Amazon truly fucks up the book industry is loss leading um, on book sales. And very regularly, really frequently, you'll find a new hardcover book on sale at Amazon for $14.99. This is a $27 or $28 book. Uh, and that's not, that's not a price I make up. If you, uh, oh, here's a nice anti-monopoly book. This is Monopolized by David hey, Dayan. There you go. Um, this, the price is printed on the jacket right there. It says $27.99. The publisher sets that price uh, in order to fairly compensate the author, the people who made the book, the editors, publicity, all that stuff. That's the price of the book. We're not overcharging for books. We're charging the price of books. But Amazon, because of all this other revenue streams, they can they can fuck around and, and loss lead. Um, and customers and know it. Fun fact: Metallica pulled that with the four ninety nine EP back in uh, back in nineteen eighty six. They're like, this EP is only four ninety nine, and uh, if those if those jerks try to sell it for more, they'll know. And I was like. <laughs> Oh, Metallica, if only you know what will become of you. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, I was going to say, it's funny they chose 1989 because they never made a good album after then. Okay. Whoa. All right. Oh. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we, we have to operate with the knowledge that, that customers know they can get a lot of these books online for 40 or 50% off. And $14.99 is actually below my cost. Uh, so selling a book at $14.99 would be the equivalent of giving a customer the book for free and also handing them $5 from the register. It would have the same effect on my bottom line. Dude, and so every oh my God. <laughs> That's so brutal. That's so brutal. And like every decision we make is based on the fact that customers know this. So we, we get creative and we get good at what we do, but that's kind of underlying the fact of everything we do. And then there's the, the Amazon is now publishing their own books. Amazon is squeezing the audiobook market. Um, Amazon is affecting how books are designed because people are trying to design covers so they look good. On, on the tiny little Amazon, um, uh, you know, profile screens. So it's just, they affect nearly everything we do. And I, you know, again, we try to do this out of the love of books, but I, I think Amazon takes up way too much real estate in my head. I wish I could focus more on the books, but we all kind of have to deal with Amazon a little bit. That's right. Let me ask you this. You, um, you know, look, like I know there's like some, uh, you know, selection bias when it comes to, uh, your customers, the people who shop at indie bookstores, you know, I feel like they're usually a little more kind of tuned into what's going on and they're, they're a little more engaged with, you know, with issues maybe than, than your average person. I don't know, but do the people you interact with, um, on a daily basis on the streets of Lawrence, Lawrence being a, it's a college town, pretty liberal place, but, um, and a pretty educated place, honestly, but, are the people that you interact with, like, do they get this stuff? Are they like, you know, there's this whole trope of like somebody goes into a bookstore, like flips through the books, figures out what they want and then says, thank you. And they go like, like the people who shop at the Raven and the people you see every day, are they kind of, are they getting it that Amazon is a problem and, and is really a threat for, for um, a lot of other kinds of commerce? I think they do. 
um, it, it's it's been amazing to see how much this has resonated. Like again, when I made the zine, I I thought we were going to sell fifty at the Raven, and that was going to be it. I, I had no idea we were going to sell thirty thousand copies of this thing. Uh, and so, like that alone, I think is evidence that people are interested in talking about this. And I hear all the time uh, people telling me, like I you know I canceled Prime because of the zine, or I, I didn't know they owned Goodreads. Or, or stuff like that right um and i i really do think people are, are more interested in, in learning about this and talking about this and i really do feel it uh kind of sinking in it's a little weird when people tell me they canceled prime because it's like i don't want to pin too much responsibility on the consumer i think that's that's a false thing like this needs to be yes. a government yes. there needs to be a government solution to this um but if like if people learn about it and are motivated to divest i mean who am i to complain uh but yeah, I, I think people really do. And I, one of the things I, I like about Lawrence is that it's managed to keep its its downtown district full of small businesses basically thriving for for a while. And, and most of the people I know down there are still there after an incredibly difficult year. And we've got bars reopening instead of closing. Um, all the retail stores I'm in communication with managed to, to kind of squeak through. Uh, so the community gets um, the importance of small businesses and independent retail. Um, I think in large part because the the efforts of the original Raven owners and their their fantastically effective kind of education comp campaign in the the Borders era. So yeah, people do get it. It is a challenge. Uh, people love Amazon. It's really convenient. Um, they sell everything. It can be hard to avoid. But I do see this discussion taking hold uh, more and more, and I'm really hopeful about that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Danny. Dude, I can't, I, I love, I love talking to you. I really do. Your, um, the work you've been doing, uh, is incredible. You've like taken, um, you've like, you know, you've taken one little piece of advocacy and you've made it like an issue and you've been an incredible champion for it. Um, so thank you so much. Um, thank you. Literally, I couldn't do it without the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. You guys, I could say the same stuff about you. So thanks so much. And thanks for having me. Bro, it's symbiotic. It's a total pleasure to have you here. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I put the for folks uh, on Twitch right now, I put the link to the book for Microcosm Publishing uh, in the chat. So check that out. Um, it's a wonderful book, uh, How to Resist Amazon and Why. Again, from the Raven Bookstore, Danny Kane. That's it. Oh, we made it through our first show. I think it's lovely. Thank you. I just, uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited to do this next week. Um, we will be is back there next week. Yeah. Is, is there an anti-monopoly moment of Zen at the end? It should be. I know. I got to do something. I got to do something better for the ending. I need like an ending thing. Anyway, we'll figure that out. Um, but for the time being, we'll be back next week at a regular time, Thursday night. Thursday, it's going to be regular Thursday night thing. Uh, 7 Eastern, 6 Central. Tune in right here. Twitch.tv slash... Ron Knox ILSR. That's how you find us here. Find us on Twitter, Anti Monopoly HH. Stands for Happy Hour. On Twitter.com. Next week, we'll be on with Sally Hubbard, who is uh, the director of Enforcement for Open Markets Institute and the author of a new book called Monopoly Suck. She is not incorrect, is impossible to locate the lie in that particular book title. Until then, stay strong, fight the power. Don't let our corporate overloads get you down and we'll see you next time. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. Cheers. <laughs>